Hello, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. And every week we bring you stories of people who are engaged in efforts to improve the world locally, globally, and digitally. We are part of Rotary International, 1.2 million members in uh, 36,000 clubs around the world. And we have the, the good fortune of being both online and asynchronous, which means we can connect with wildly interesting people anywhere who have stories that we think uh, Rotarians and those dedicated to service should hear. In this case, however, our speaker is just down the road uh, at, at San Jose State University, all of, uh, all of a, a good long walk from, uh, from where I live. And so our, our speaker, Anthony, uh, Anthony Chow, is, uh, is somebody you've read about coming into this. Uh, he is part of, uh, of the uh, University, San Jose State University School of Information. He has uh, a lot of personal experience that led him to the point where uh, he, he was someone who could, uh, who could helm the, the project related to, uh, to Reading Nation Waterfall. And we are excited to hear about it. So Anthony, thank you again so much for being part of the project. And we welcome you to the E-Club of Silicon Valley. Thank you so much, Russ. And it's a, a real pleasure to be here. Let me set my timer to make sure I stay on track. There we go. So yes, uh, my name is Dr. Anthony Chow. I'm the uh, director of the School of Information at San Jose State University. Uh, and um, I'm here to talk about our um, early children literacy project for tribal communities, uh, Reading Nation Waterfall. So Reading Nation Waterfall is a IMLS funded uh, three year $1.4 million grant. Uh, and it was based on a pilot study, a one year pilot study uh, with the Blackfeet Nation. So, let me, uh, so a little bit more about our projects that so you can see there on the left, uh, we have five partners. Uh, so we have three on the uh, western side of the country and then two on the eastern side. So um, and three states involved. So we have two tribes in Montana. Uh, that is the um, Northern Cheyenne and the Crow. Uh, and then we have one in New Mexico, the Santo Domingo Pablo. Uh, and then we have two on the eastern side from North Carolina. So I actually just left a position at University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Uh, and that was that would be the Lumbee uh, uh, and also the Eastern Band of Cherokee. Um, I first became interested in this project because I was the state um, evaluator for uh, Montana, the state library. And uh, I'm gonna show you some statistics that caused me to really start to investigate this further. So before we do though, um, of all the pictures we've taken in this project, this has to be my favorite of all. Uh, and the reason for that is because of the, um, the inquiry, the marvel, the, the uh, I wonder what book I'm gonna take for free. Uh, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of what we've heard from our librarians, uh, this, was, this is actually, I believe at the Head Start program, uh, in uh, in um, Robinson County with the Lumbee, uh, it was the kids asking if they really could take the books for free, right? And so when this young man was told he could take uh, he could take uh, one or two books, he you could see his uh, his question of hmm, I wonder which one uh, I should take. Um, this here is a visual image of I believe the start of the love of reading, uh, and that really starts with both choice as well as reading things that you wanna read about. And I think that this right here, I believe is the step towards the love of reading for this young man. So we really have three goals. Uh, our, our three goals are to increase access to books in libraries and really literacy resources uh, for children in uh, tribal communities and the, these five tribal partnerships. Increase reading at home. Of course, increasing reading at home starts with having books uh, in which to read. Uh, and then increasing the use of libraries in general. And I'll get into kind of the stats uh, in just a second, but ultimately these are the three goals, primary goals of our project. Three primary outcomes. So if we are successful, um, we really hope that there'll be three bodacious outcomes, if you will. I remember when I first taught uh, Rust, Rustin, he and I, I think, think alike uh, in terms of uh, going for a high ambitious goal. So I, our belief, uh, given the assumption and current data that we found is that a lot of the children in our five communities uh, are growing up in book deserts. Uh, and what, what that means is they don't have access to a lot of books, period. 
Uh, and so what we have heard from the kindergarten teachers is that the overall reading level of children coming into kindergarten uh, is not, not very good. Anywhere from 70 to 80% of the children coming into their kindergarten classrooms are not at reading level. Increase NAEP fourth grade reading score. So as you're probably aware, uh, every two years, the national government or the federal government uh, requires all fourth graders across the land uh, to take a reading, a reading test. And so um, I'm gonna show you the startling statistics in the next slide to show you uh, that over the last 20 years, while the rest of the country uh, increased reading scores, uh, uh, Native American children at the fourth grade level, those reading scores have dropped every single year. Um, and then a literacy network. So there are so many people that are interested in trying to, to build and support literacy in our communities. Uh, but IMLS, as the Institute of Museum of Library um, and Museum Services, uh, believe, as I do, that libraries are one of those community anchors uh, that can help take the lead in ensuring that these books uh, are available. Uh, but we also have to work very closely with schools uh, and, in, and in particular, um, for this project, Head Start centers, and it's not necessarily Head Start uh, specifically, but rather working with pre-K children before they get into the kindergarten classroom. Now, this love the, the cutie pies. So this is the chart that really helps illustrate uh, why I became interested in this project. So as the state evaluator for Montana, my job was to look at the community, look at the state of Montana, and look at the performance indicators available. Uh, and so what I ended up discovering on a national basis, and so not just at the state of Montana, but on a national basis is this statistical gap. So you'll note in 2000, um, actually Native American uh, children at the fourth grade level actually scored one point higher than the national average. But every year since, give or take a, a little blip here uh, from 2005 to 2009, it's dropped precipitously. Well, nationally, the rest of the, uh, the nation has increased, you know, again, a, a, a few point drop uh, the last couple of years. But the bottom line is you can see that gap widening. So by 2019, which is the last uh, uh, um, uh, data point that, that the NAP has released, um, you can see that you've got a 16 point difference between the nation uh, and Native American children. So um, I, that is a, a statistically significant difference. And so there is certainly something happening uh, that we wanted to study. And so that really began my inquiry uh, into uh, what was causing this. So our research findings. So uh, part of our process, and the, the, uh, we've uh, uh, successfully conducted at least a, 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 some aspect of a community assessment in four of the five tribes that we're working with. Obviously, the pandemic has made it difficult on all of us. Uh, and so we are still working with the Santo Domingo Pueblo. Uh, but the bottom line is we have uh, found that parents find reading important. So when we ask parents, they believe it is important for the Native American community. Uh, and they also recognize that reading is critically important for the success of their children. They also say in the same survey that they don't tend to use libraries very much uh, and they have limited access to books. So they recognize the importance, but for some reason are not able to get access to books. The word waterfall is, uh, is, is was added there as a resolute and aspirational metaphor. So you see there uh, the famous, uh, e, uh, forgetting the name of it now, uh, but the famous waterfall in Glacier National Park uh, that is actually a confluence of three waterfalls that form into one. So what do I mean by that? So graphically speaking, let me present to you a hypothetical model. So let's say that middle-class uh, families on average read two books per day. Uh, and so uh, starting with the uh, year, uh, the first year of their life, uh, we will say on average 730 books all the way to year five as they get the kindergarten. So that's 4,380 books uh, read. Uh, now let's look at a book desert. So let's assume two books per week, two books per week for the first five years. That's 624 books. So you can see the massive gap. Uh, between uh, children that have access to books or have been read to and those uh, that uh, do not. 
So here's our vision. Our vision is to form uh, literacy networks uh, using little free libraries as one of the primary net mechanisms. And so the idea here is really to uh, start before they get to kindergarten, uh, have public libraries, which uh, are starting to happen nationally, uh, where they're no longer checking out books, but rather giving them out for free, uh, and also ensuring uh, that they also have access to free books at the elementary school as well. Now, the, the key point to uh, building uh, really this literacy ecosystem is pumping books into the system, and, and of course, libraries can help with that. So from a budgetary standpoint, what could you do? What could we do? What am I asking for as far as uh, help? So this is, a, again, a federally funded project. Um, we don't have enough money to make really that much of a dent, right? So we need sponsors to purchase books for the little free libraries. We need more books. Um, myself and my parents are actually dedicating a memorial library to one of the little free library the little free library at the head start center uh, at, uh, at uh, the eastern band of cherokee in cherokee north carolina which is at the foothills of, of the smokies and right now we're funding 10 books a week now i just i put a little table there so depending on the research um approximately 80 books or more in one's household uh by fourth grade uh, leads to uh, uh, significantly positive academic achievement. So again, I, uh, 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 using that one study, uh, if we had uh, 150 students at Head Start uh, over uh, a span of seven years, uh, we would need 12,000 books, right? And so that basically is per week, 32 books uh, at that little free library every single week. Uh, for seven years. And so that would mean a book budget of $8,571 if, you know, again, we had an average price of a book of five, say $5. Libraries can help with that, however. Libraries can help in terms of both providing a lot more books uh, and certainly as they start to uh, uh, remove uh, overdue fines, uh, it, it re they really could be part of uh, and really help lead uh, the literacy network. So I have 46 seconds to spare, Rushton. Um, Nicely done. In the end, uh, I, I will say this, that, that as the evaluator for the state of Montana, um, I was so bothered by that statistic that I took it upon myself to try to do something. And so I think that in the end, the, pro the problem is so ginormous and it's certainly not just limited to uh, Native American children. I think book deserts are driven mostly, if not completely, by social, uh, social economic differences. Um, you know, when I think of a child, uh, I think that of course we must fight for equal access for those children, so. All right, well, Anthony, thank you very much for, uh, for your presentation. What we're gonna do is I wanna introduce the folks that we have on the call. Uh, my name is Rushton Hurley. I am the charter president of the Rotary Club of Silicon Valley and the programs chair currently. And we have with us also our treasurer, Cecilia Babkirk in San Jose, California. And uh, we also have a friend of the club, Heather Edwards of the Rotary Club of Eugene Metropolitan, who is currently in Tlaquipaque, Mexico. So uh, the first question that came in uh, from Heather was, was about partnerships. Uh, so she mentions uh, Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. H have you found that, that things that you are doing allow for certain kinds of partnerships that have been uh, constructive in, in trying to build on the, uh, the work that Reading Nation Waterfall has begun? Yeah, I think, I think uh, everyone speaks so highly of the Imagination Library. And again, all the amazing things that Dolly Parton and her organization has done. We have not formally reached out to, to them um, only because we're not there yet. <laughs> so uh, year one was supposed to be last year during the height of the pandemic. And so everything kind of fell apart uh, in terms of, you know, the, the getting the little free libraries up, uh, you know, kind of getting that the circulation of books out there. So we're just trying to get off the ground, to be honest, in terms of, you know, getting that cert that ecosystem that I showed you uh, moving a little bit, but absolutely no. I think the Imagination Library and what they do uh, would be a would be a huge partner. So, 
speaking of partnerships, when, when we think, and let's go ahead and stop sharing screen for the moment. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of partnerships, you know, in, in talking about the, the five tribes, uh, it, it strikes me as someone interested in how good, good beneficial projects can be sustainable that, that you start with relationships. And so you spent time in North Carolina. Uh, you spent time in Montana. Uh, are, are, all of the, are all of the connections to the tribes a function of your personal experiences and developing relationships that would allow really discussing the kind of logistics that are necessary for the project? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say the answer is no. I would say that um, what we find in the field is that the fair majority of librarians um, are not native or, or are mostly white female. Uh, and so uh, even on, at the tribal locations, uh, most of the librarians are, are white female. Right. And so they're not members of the tribe. Now, the reason why that's important, Rushton, is because they're trying to help. Uh, but there certainly is um, that barrier between not being native and trying to help uh, in, and really having it embraced. So, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and the answer is no. Uh, I, I've, I found them through the librarians um, and not through the tribe themselves. Right. So I reached out and, and recruited librarians that would be willing to partner uh, with us. And to build on your point, Rushton, um, talking to the tribal library at the Eastern Band, um, it was funny, we, we I visited uh, last summer, and, and he's like, you know, we have five uh, um, uh, um, Head Start centers. So I wonder if I could ask the chief to just fund a little free library for all five, uh, and, and as part of my budget. And I'm like, yes, yes, so let, let's do that. Uh, I don't think it happened yet. But it's an example, Rushton, of what you're saying, that that really uh, what we can report back as a community saying we want this, but there's a gap right now. And one of the things that they're saying is a gap is that the tribal leadership is not really uh, prioritizing this. So mm -hmm. now my, my guess is that tribal leadership prioritizing in any given uh, sustainable sust and, and from their perspective, sustainable effort is a function of having built trust that this is not somebody or some outfit that's going to show up and, and do three things over a weekend, take some pictures and leave, right? Um, so, you know, when you think about the, the barrier that, that is the non-native uh, non librarian in the community, however pure that person's heart may be wanting to help, have, has your project or has the school of information taken on the idea of like how do we get more librarians from within the communities to be uh, part of, of any given literacy effort yeah that's a great question rustin and we actually have written an imls grant uh to fund three uh full scholarships in the five tribes that we're working with and the, and, the, and the requirement is that well the requirement is not that they be Native American because obviously we couldn't, we cannot do that legally. Uh, but of course, the focus would be on on Native American, and so um, uh, even as part of the proposal, we recruited uh, at least I think six Native American uh, members of the community that would be willing to to pursue uh, and receive a full scholarship. And and uh, IMLS is very excited about that because, as you said, Russian, that really is the key is to build that capacity from within. Uh, so, so that uh, there's more of that resonance. And we also, as you probably know, Rustin, uh, there's, there's a lot of very um, real and, and earned uh, negativity that the Native American community has towards formal education because of those boarding schools, right? That, that really, and, and libraries, uh, we have a part to play in that as well. Uh, is that in that in the in 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 the past we oftentimes maybe were a little heavy-handed as far as what you should read, uh, but really over the last fifteen to twenty years that has moved away to just read. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter what it is, just read. Uh, but I think certainly in the past there was a, a propensity to push a little bit more the classics and things like that. But I think now uh, certainly that's evolved the way to just whatever it is you want to read, we'll provide that for you. So. So. How about um, tapping into to stories of of the specific communities that you're working with? Like, like how how does it work to try to 
create more opportunities to share the stories that, uh, that are a part of the, of the tribal history and traditions. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we've actually written another grant um, that is actually looking to do that. So we are working with the Northern Cheyenne to um, preserve their language uh, and, cult and cultural artifacts through virtual reality. So the Northern Cheyenne and Eastern Bend actually uh, are, uh, there are less than 300 native speakers in their population. And most of those are seniors, right? So there is actually a real uh, urgency see and, and, and ensuring that those those types of things happen. The other part to our grant is we actually are commissioning a native, a native indigenous work. So part of our uh, part of our focus is ensuring that the, the material that is available to be read or consumed is written by and for uh, the Native American community. So we actually have a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit of funding to try to hopefully jump jump start that. And I know uh, the Crow, um, who um, are the leaders really of our project right now in terms of disseminating books, uh, they are preparing, uh, putting together a coloring book written by, by the, their Native American teachers. Uh, so, and that Rustin ties exactly with what you're saying as far as the imagery, the values um, uh, being part of what they're reading so the kids can see more of themselves uh, when they read. And then the last thing is oral history. So obviously a lot of Native American, actually all Native American communities for the most part uh, have a very strong oral history. Uh, and so we have been recording oral histories and putting them up, up on their website as part of our Reading Nation Waterfall project and also on the YouTube channel uh, as a way to, to leverage that type of communication uh, for, for, their, for their children. With not maybe controversial or not uh, with the line in the sand of reading uh, both literacy and digital is still very important right and we so we don't want to disrespect uh, oral history but the bottom line is you've got to be able to read in this society right uh, in, in order to consume and, and and empower yourself so could you say a little bit more about your own experiences on on the way to becoming someone interested in library media and, and information science, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, my, um, my background in education started when I was in college undergraduate. I was pursuing my degree in developmental psychology. And so I worked with at-risk children uh, and learned a lot um, because what I discovered was that, you know, all kids are good kids. Uh, but if you're not if you're not a good fit for the current education system, which these kids were not, so one kid didn't speak English, one kid had dyslexia, uh, many of the kids could care less, uh, and and were kind of in a in a situation where they weren't really being held accountable, uh, so they were kind of straying, and so that really got me interested in kind of education as a as a system in which we 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 um, understand the needs of our learners. And we customize and meet those needs uh, accordingly, and so, um, and so really that began my my thirst for. Uh, so I got my master's degree in educational psychology and my PhD in instructional design, uh, but that really began my thirst for uh, the provision of information and the power of learning and education, uh, and ensuring that um, we try to equal the playing field for those that may uh, may not either be interested or have had bad experiences. Uh, with that. And so I think that was part, kind of the context to my work with Montana. And then that kind of opened the door to, okay, there's some inequity happening here, right? So I'm a, uh, from an educational research standpoint, the stats don't lie. Well, stats can lie, but this type of data, uh, there's something wrong, right? In other words, uh, you know, obviously there, we could add cultural bias and testing, but you know, all of those things that are real, Right. But the bottom line is that if I see that the Native American community in 2000 scored higher than the national average. So regardless of the biases and then they, I see them dropping each year, uh, there, there's a problem. So for me, uh, that's why I love education, because we get to study problems and try to solve them. So the the graph that you showed about the um, the, the point in 1998, 2000, when you know, when Native American children readers were, were above the national average and, and point, yep. off, right? Mm -hmm. Is there is there something that the communities themselves would say is is a cause of of that kind of drop off? Or or is it something that they are 
you, you know, that they are aware of in terms of, of uh, sharing of this kind of information, um, you know, and, and if so, like, you know, I'm sure that that's wrapped up in all sorts of things that you mentioned, right? Uh, a lack of trust in, uh, in the, 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 where the government were here to help kind of approach, right? Um, so, so what, what have you heard from the communities themselves about the concerns uh, that they have for their, their children developing their, their reading skills? Yeah, that's a great question. I think what I've heard, and, by, and again, this is just the initial preliminary data, there's, there's a lot of pain, uh, there's a lot of anger, and there's a lot of uh, uh, family systems that maybe a lot of us take for granted that were broken or not, not necessarily present at a high level. So let's start with, with the aversion of education caused by you know, the, the boarding schools and the civilization of Indians, right? In other words, the, the idea that we're gonna push onto them things that, that will civilize them and, and basically say, you know, um, uh, everything that you are is not, you know, what, what you should be. And so, so that is kind of a result of what we would call systematic racism, right? Which is that everything that you read, everything you see basically says you should be something else. Right. And so, um, that kind of creates a psychological aversion to education <laughs> in terms of, okay, I don't want to read any more about that. Um, another statement that, that I will never forget uh, it, it goes to the family system where uh, the person uh, was a little bit younger than me, but basically said that, that my generation, our generation, uh, a lot of those parents do not know how to parent because they grew up in boarding schools and they did not grow up with parents at all, right? And so once they became parents, they actually did not have any visual role models for exactly what you're supposed to do as a parent, right? And so, uh, so that was astounding. Right, uh, that that really the whole family structure for a lot, uh, or at least some of the Native American um, uh, community members I talked to uh, was broken. Right, it was just completely broken. Um, and then the, the 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 third thing I would say is that when you are angry, when you feel bad about yourself, um, drugs and alcohol become a big problem. Right, and that's not just for that's for everybody. Right, I think that's across the board. Uh, and, and I find that quite interesting because of the, um, the success of casinos. So, for example, the Eastern Band, uh, their, their um, casino is very successful. And so they actually get a monthly check. Every, every member of their tribe gets a monthly check from the casino proceeds. So what I'm told is that money is not an issue. That, that they actually get a check every month. Uh, and, and so money is not as much of an issue as we might think. So when we think poverty, uh, Eastern Band is an example of, well, it's not really poverty, uh, but as they would tell me, they told me, it's what you do with the check, mm -hmm. right? So, so it's not poverty per se, but it's actually what you do with the check. And so basically what I'm told is a lot of it's used for drugs and alcohol, right? And so obviously, that's not conducive to stable families. It's not conducive to role modeling. And it's not conducive to uh, those of you that are parents, you know how much work it takes uh, and how much money it costs. Uh, and so, um, you know, obviously if you're not, if you're suffering as an adult uh, and you might not be able to focus in on that as much, so. Well, in, in talking to you about the, uh, the Reading Nation Waterfall Project and you know, over the times we've met, uh, I've, I've been especially impressed with the care that uh, that your team has has brought to listening to the the members of the tribes uh, as as you as you work with them on different strategies for uh, for possibilities of illiteracy and 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 I thank you and and the work that's being done at San Jose State for uh, for making a difference there We'll wind down the recording, and uh, then once I've been through a few of the logistics, uh, I'll hand it back to you for a final word. But for all of you who are joining us, thank you for being part of our, our program today. It, uh, it is very much our hope that the kinds of stories that we share lead to a better understanding of how to be more effective as, as people of service, people of action. Uh, and that learning to uh, learning to listen to those uh, and, and adjusting, you want to help and, and adjusting one's plans in order to properly meet 
is, is an ongoing uh, is an ongoing effort. Uh, one that I, I, as much as I even teach this, is a part of a thing I do. There are moments uh, where I think, ah, I, I fell into the trap again, right? So, uh, so a, a wonderful message to us, uh, Anthony, about the, the work that you guys are doing, and and I appreciate it so much. Uh, guests, please let us know you are here. There is a, an attendance form just slightly down the page, and then a little farther, you'll find the discuss section, D-I-S-Q-U-S. It is our forum for sharing ideas that we get as a part of these programs, and also any of the content that we share as part of the meetings. Uh, you can always find us at rotary.cool. That is the easy way to get to our club site, and we hope that you'll click on that meetings archive, perhaps at the top, in order to hear from so many wonderful speakers that we are, we are very fortunate to connect with. As we like to do, we hand it back to our speaker for the final word. Uh, Anthony, I, I hand the mic to you. I appreciate it. I think that um, my experience in, the, in this project certainly has raised a lot of questions in terms of uh, how do we help people or how do we help uh, and, and at what point is trying to help not helping um, uh, if, if there's not commitment, I think, Russian, as we, as we talked about. However, I, one of the things that has kept me resolute is no matter who I talk to, uh, I think people can agree on the children, right? The, regardless of the complexity of all that we're talking about, I think everybody can agree it's not the children's fault. And as, as they are born in this, in this world, that we do the best we can as a society to um, provide equity, right? And so I do believe uh, there are very, there's systematic reasons for how people turn out uh, and literacy is one of them, right? So um, one of the stats that I find always startling, and you've heard this probably many times, is that, that uh, uh, counties and cities plan the number of cells uh, that they need uh, based on third grade literacy scores in their communities, right? And the reason for that is because this, the correlation between the illiteracy and those that are incarcerated is extremely high, right? And so that's just a fact. So when we look at the quality of our own communities, I believe a very single variable that we should focus on as a society is that third grade level that have we done everything in our community's power to make sure those children are literate by third grade? Because if they're not, bad things happen. Bad things happen to them, bad things happen to our community. So life is complicated, obviously, with the violence and, the, and all the other things that are happening in our society. Uh, but I think this is one thing that maybe we could focus on to make a significant difference in, in the lives of children in our community in general. Powerfully said. Everyone, we will see you next week.